Dr. Kaz Kolakowski, Board of Governors, Professor of Computer Science at Rutgers. Thank you, Brian. One of the difficulties in present, preparing this talk is knowing that Saul is the father of representation in AI. How should I represent his life? It's a major quandary. So I went for simplicity. Using and what's the simplest thing that one can do but to come up with a chronological description of how Saul has proceeded and try to outline some of these extremely yes so we'll start at the beginning. So I was born in Salonika in northern Greece, up here, in a very cosmopolitan ancient town. It was uh, one of the second capitals of the Byzantine Empire uh, for a long time. Uh, he comes from a very distinguished, erudite family of uh, rabbinical scholars, the Amarillos, who are known way back to the 16th century in developing uh, Talmudic commentary. Uh, so passed a relatively uh, uneventful childhood, or so he tells me, uh, <laughs> until 1941 when the Nazis invaded Greece, uh, when his whole family they went down to Athens, which was at that point occupied by the Italians and didn't enforce the racial laws. So he managed to go to high school there. And unfortunately, when Italy fell and the Germans occupied uh, all of Greece, he then found that he had to do something more drastic. And that's what led to his first discovery of his, some of his technical talents. He became a partisan in the Peloponnesus, in the area near ancient Sparta, maybe deriving a bit of uh, strength <coughs> from some of their example, and became an expert in communications and demolition. Uh, blowing up bridges, doing all kinds of uh, sabotage, and generally uh, useful work for the resistance. As things got tougher, he was able to show his ingenuity by organizing a group that moved his whole family and 70 other people from Salonika to this island here in Uboa, where after hiding for a while in some caves by the sea, they were picked up by a freighter who was organized by the British and brought over across the Aegean to Turkey where a train was ready to meet them at Izmir and take them down to Gaza. The British, of course, were very concerned that uh, there might be German spies hiding in Queens, so they were interned there in Gaza. But with the help of Jewish groups, Saul was able to get out and spent some wonderful times of his childhood relaxing after all the excitement, but tension, and danger of his work in the guerrillas in a kibbutz. And it was with great difficulty and with great reluctance that he followed his father's advice, who told him you'd better pursue some of the great technical talents he'd uh, shown in the resistance and go to the premier institution for technical training in Israel, the Technion, where he started his studies in Italy in architecture, showing great interest in structure and unity of thinking and uh, beginning to display some of the vision that he has shown in his work in AI over the years, and then moving to electrical engineering and doing practical work in double E. And he continued this through the time of Israel's independence. <coughs> At that point, he had to interrupt his studies as he well, joined the army and again made use of his experience in demolition work uh, during the War of Independence. Fortunately, the army let all the young fighters uh, free after the war to be able to continue their studies. And in two very tough months of cramming, he managed to finish and complete his bachelor's degree at the Technion and received his diploma from Ben-Gurion himself, probably among the first uh, group of graduates in the Technion after Israel's independence, <coughs> 50 years ago. Yes. A very recent. At the same time, down the road from us, in Princeton, New Jersey, at the 
Institute of Advanced Study. Von Neumann, Oppenheimer, and other famous people were working on the beginnings of computing. And among, among them was, uh, let's see, it's Ephraim Fry, who was in charge of the Weizmann Institute's efforts on computing, and Jerry Estrin, who developed the first Israeli computer. While Saul was working for the Ministry of Defense in Israel, he was recruited to work on problems of automatic control, as well as on computational problems, and this was his first introduction to computing. Uh, he continued at the Technion, finished his master's degree, uh, well, the equivalent, the Diploma of Engineer in 1949, and then continued working at the Ministry of Defense <coughs> with people from Weizmann in a later photograph. <coughs> and his experience in control and in computation led them to send him to Columbia University in the early 50s, where he got his master's degree. Saul did very well, so well that they called him back. He was back in Israel for the 56 war. Uh, but he liked Columbia, and he wanted to finish a doctorate. Very fortunately, his advisor at Columbia uh, gave him the wherewithal to come back and complete his doctorate there, after which he then again returned to Israel. But, liking the United States, he came and interviewed at a number of places, including IBM, and where he settled at RCA, where Reichman <laughs> yeah, recruited him. Reichman was one of the early developers of magnetic cores that were critical in the development of logic circuits uh, central to the building of computers. And here is Saul showing his propensity with various interesting devices that involve logical circuits. He started working with a number of people, including uh, <coughs> Drozhovsky, with whom he published papers on the theoretical considerations and reliability of recursive triangular switching networks using very traditional mathematical analysis methods. And if any of you think that Saul was always an abstract thinker, I have here Exhibit A, which shows that Saul is actually the author of a patent in the area of uh, switching circuits, which uh, he received while he was at RCA. And there's some real hardware here. <laughs> the picture we just saw of him behind a computer is not his only connection with hardware in his life. <laughs> at that time, however, Saul started taking a tremendous interest in computer theory. And he was a member, or he joined one of the first conferences, the Allerton Conference in Illinois, at which some notable luminaries, you know, von Forster, McCulloch from McCulloch and Pitts, mm -hmm. uh, Rosenblatt from the Perceptron, um, Ashby, and here is our hero. So <laughs> that, if, with the ever-present pipe, that seems to have been his trademark at that particular time. So inspired by some of the work of McCulloch, <coughs> so all kept on working with these very interesting logical circuits. And he collaborated with a number of very famous people at RCA, including Bob Winder, shown here on the blackboard. And if some of you look rather carefully, you will see yourselves here. Uh, our chairman of the Department of Computer Science from 1990 uh, to 96, Professor Kenneth Kaplan, is shown here not very clearly, just the back of his head, with a hint of a goatee that I didn't know about until we discovered this particular picture. And believe it or not, this is Saul Levy next to him. And they're sitting next to each other today. Change much. So we switch sides. Well, I can always do this. <laughs> Saul started writing some of the very first uh, papers in automatic theory formation at that time. He tried to abstract out the principles of problem solving in a very unique way. This is from 1962. And here's the picture that corresponds to his visionary pose. Looking up the <laughs> He also started looking at how you could automate the representation of theory 
And this is probably the first paper that I found that uses the word representation or how you could represent a theory in the paper on the book on self-organizing systems uh, that was Marshall Jovitz, who was also in that picture that I showed earlier at Allerton. So, began showing his great organizational talent in the field of AI when he organized the first meeting of the IEEE Northern Section uh, to discuss AI. And he started abstracting his work and giving the grand architectural view in his paper in the IEEE Spectrum on the mechanization of creative processes, which appropriately the artist chose an eye down here, which foreshadows some of his later work in collaborating with us in ophthalmology. And for the first time, he says here that, oh, I have a hard time seeing this myself, selecting appropriate representations for problem solving situations will be taking an enormous step towards advancing artificial intelligence. Even in 1966, he knew it. A seminal uh, or catalytic event in Saul's career at that time came from visiting Carnegie uh, Institute of Technology, as it was then known in 1966, uh, where he organized a seminar uh, on artificial intelligence with Alan Ewell, who spoke on what the current problems were in AI at the time, with Herb Simon, who talked about representation problems in tic-tac-toe, and from Saul, who developed probably the most detailed problem, the monkey problem, the monkey and bananas problem. Okay? He gives alternative representations of how monkeys will reach bananas, which was an incredibly detailed but abstract way of expressing problem solving, move beyond the details of the circuits on which these representations were based. Next year, well, two years later, he came up with a paper which is probably his best known contribution in Machine Intelligence 3 on representations of problems of reasoning about actions, which is probably one of the most widely quoted papers in AI, cited papers in AI. It was around this time that he came to know at Feigenbaum, probably a little bit earlier than that, but he came to know of Ed's work at Stanford on practical applications moving beyond uh, games in problems of the analysis of DNA, RNA with Josh Lederberg, which Ed had started working, and he wrote an invited commentary on this, expressing his admiration for this work. And at the same time, he was on the NIH's committee uh, for chemical and biological information handling, where he came to know the then executive secretary, Bill Rao, who was an extremely uh, practical and visionary uh, director of NIH later, um, expert in physiology and uh, numerical methods, a student of uh, Bill Yamamoto's at uh, Penn. And they forged a um, common view of the future of AI. Uh, in medicine and the possibilities that it had. At that point, the NIH was funding largely uh, a lot of large machines, and so started developing the idea that maybe they should be looking not only at funding large cars of machines, but also large groups of people who would come up with innovative ideas. Uh, very advanced ideas related, guess what? The problems of representation of problem solving <laughs> that he had in mind. At that time, he also became one of the directors of the Association for Cybernetics, okay, together with Bill Forster, and McCulloch was the previous director. And uh, he was clearly getting too big for his shoes at RCA. He had to do something better. And we were very fortunate here at Rutgers at the time to have a very forward-looking uh, physicist who had just been named the new dean of Livingston College, an urban-oriented college here at Rutgers. And uh, very sadly, uh, Ernest died just uh, a month ago. Uh, but he was a wonderful man who started Livingston College. And this is our first building, Philip Hall, over there, where Saul moved in and became Rutgers Chief that hails computer tool for keen intelligence. Right. <laughs> there was 
with an appropriately politically incorrect notion of a co-ed that tackles computer. So all this happily pseudo-izing is in the work. At the same time, Saul was busy planning, one of the things he loves most, because he brings his vision to bear on very concrete actions. And here with Mason Gross, the president of the university at the time, uh, the chair of statistics at the time, the chair of mathematics at the time, Kenneth Wilson, uh, Cohen, both of whom uh, were here sharing our building. He is looking, overseeing the uh, plans, the model, for the new building, the Hill Center, to which we were about to move from Tennant Hall in 1972. So I was very, very active in doing computer science education. And you probably can see on the side of the room, and you saw the photo that I took of a number of uh, posters that were spread all around campus at the time, uh, of Saul talking about computer science education. He didn't stop at that. He went national and gave papers at all the major computer science conferences. This is from the Spring Joint Conference in 1972. And internally, this was built on the kind of detailed infrastructure and work that has made so famous or notorious over the years. In our department, I discovered among all the interesting old memos that I was supposed to have thrown away long ago, according to my wife, uh, a list of all the committees that Saul organized around that time. And I think he was notorious and continues to be as a person that probably had a department with more committees than the rest of the university put together. Uh, he was developing a program with a lot of undergraduate courses, but you'll notice even more graduate courses. So from the very beginning, had the vision of turning Rutgers into a world-class, top-level graduate program in computer science. And not content with staying with New Jersey, he also wrote and thought with Ernest Linton, who was a great visionary in that regard, on computer problems and educational systems in developing countries. Same time, we have a few other artifacts from the era, the proceedings of the department, where you will see that Donald Mickey was invited, gave one of the earliest talks from Edinburgh. Uh, this newsletter was put together by um, David Farnas came, Clark Hell, a good old friend from Princeton, came to the medical school and started some of the work uh, together with Saul and with me, who were being recruited by him in 1970. And based on the work that uh, Saul had begun thinking about <coughs> put together a proposal to the NIH for the then astronomical sum of about 2.3 million, uh, 352,000 for the first year, of which, in the ways of government, we only got 117,000 <laughs> for the first year. But so another one of Saul's characteristics of the world now is that he never gives up. So he went back and pestered Bill Robb and everyone else and managed them, managed to get another 30,000 out of them to get around to them. <laughs> At that time, just to make sure that we didn't keep our life under a bushel, he started inviting a number of people who were working in the same area, most notably Ed Weigenbaum, who we're very fortunate to have with us today, to talk about AI methods and scientific inference the incorrectly spelt Dendral system, our secretary at the time, a very wonderful person, Elsie Jackson, unfortunately was not familiar with it and misspelled it as Dendral. And we had Jaime Carmel Sr. give a wonderful talk on AI approaches to computer assisted instruction. And we had Tony Gorey coming to us from MIT at the time. And we had his old colleague from, IBA, from uh, RCA, Jack Sklansky joining to talk about biomedical image processing. And with all of this, you may have noticed that something under here says Rutgers Medical School. Rutgers had a medical school at the time. And we're hoping that maybe in someday soon we'll have one again. But uh, Saul was one of the real uh, founders of the combination between AI and medicine. He, he foresaw this. In 1972, just as this was getting off the ground, we moved into the New Hill Center. These are our early computers, a lot of big blue iron. And here is Saul in his, one of the early pictures in the chairman's office 
which is still the chairman's office that Tomas uh, occupies in the Hill Centre. So all is now gone up one floor, on the fourth floor. Just the same tiles. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you will notice here the horizontal stacking system that's all the rest of This new office has everything, and I have inherited the same bad habit. My office is covered from one end to the other by these horizontal piles. Uh, Saul kept on uh, getting us to issue some very good proceedings, and here you see that we had. Uh, a number of new faculty coming for various times. Here's Saul Levy joined us. Uh, Bob Vishnevevsky also came to us. And we started increasing in diversity. As you will notice from the comment that Charles McGrew put here, those of you who know Bob Vishnevevsky uh, know that he's been very adamant that while he's in the Department of Computer Science, he's really an engineer. Uh, when Gil Falk left, I took over the uh, writing of our little proceedings, and I put this up because it, I happened to find in my archaeological dig something that you will barely see here. These are the notes that Saul gave me when he asked me to take over editing the proceedings. I realized it was a very easy job because Saul had basically written it for me. I had no trouble copying it, but where I did have trouble was deciphering his number one pencil with which he writes everything that he writes. You, you really need a magnifying glass and you have to look very carefully to see what it is that he's actually written. Well, at about that time, uh, the work that Saul had started here at Rutgers and the work that Ed had started at Stanford blossomed entirely. The scene moves over to Stanford, the beautiful West Coast, where Ed and Josh Lederberg started the Summit Aim Resource which added on to the intellectual group that we had started building here at Rutgers, their own group, and a computer resource based on the latest in time sharing uh, devices. You can see that Saul and I gave one of the talks after Ed gave the introduction on problems of AI. And we have a number of famous names here, Bruce Buchanan, Ted Shortliff. Uh, Ken Colby was heavily into the modeling of paranoia in those days. And Josh, of course, gave the wonderful overview. And here is a picture of Ed, who you will see shortly. As an introduction under the appropriate word, intelligence, the byline. Not artificial mind. And here's Josh Lederberg. And to capture the spirit of the times, basically the problems and promises of AI applied in medicine, that the neurons hit the brain. We started organizing a number of workshops here at Rutgers. We put together the AI medicine workshops uh, with a the theme of knowledge-based AI systems. Many of you here who were there at the time uh, came. Here's a picture of Ted Shortliff. Um, Harry Pobel and Jack Myers, who also sadly passed away recently. And our own little group, Sholem Weiss, Ken Kevin Kern, Peter Boyatakis, and myself, who worked with Saw on the development of the glaucoma system with Aaron Sattler. At the same time, we have here the fact that Ed headed a panel of which Roger Shank was in, who's here with us today also. And at one of the later workshops, we had Raj Reddy give us a very inspiring keynote speech on the integration of our AI systems into equipment. He said that none of our AI systems would succeed until we miniaturized them and managed to put them inside an instrument which we promptly did after that. And he foreshadowed uh, the work on intelligent systems uh, by some of his comments. With Saul, we put together a paper in the AI journal on this model-based method, the causal networks for describing glaucoma and other diseases and doing automated decision-making. And of course, Saul being very active on all fronts was at the same time uh, <coughs> working with the university against a very terrible idea that the state had at that time, which was that they would centralize all computers down in Trenton, not only for all the universities, but also for all the agencies. Just at the time that many computers were emerging, they had the idea that they wanted to centralize everything with one massive machine down there. And they didn't want Rutgers to buy its own machine. Well, you all know Saul's legendary persistence he managed through many, many long committees, both in Trenton and all around the state, to convince people that the centralized and dumb 
there were handed off to Brom, and Rutgers was able to keep its machines. And in fact, he brought the first big time sharing machine here to Rutgers, the PDP-10, that supported our resource on AI and medicine. <laughs> on the other hand, communications wasn't exactly the speed that we're used to it now. Here's a picture of Saul, myself, all of us much younger, with Bill Sabins, who was with us at the time. And being uh, hotshot researchers, here's a picture of Sridharan, with one of our long-term students here, I don't know if some of you who've been here recognize John Brezina. He just got his degree last year. <laughs> this is 1977. <laughs> we have some very intense students. <laughs> now, someone who was moving much more of a fast track, there's Tom Mitchell telling Lou Steinberg, and I don't take credit for these captions, I should thank Charles McGrew for them, now doing all kinds of interesting networking, and uh, so, um, Lafitte, one of our other faculty at the time, this is back in the mid to late 70s. And at the same time, we were honored with a visit by an author who you may remember, Fletcher Knabel, was, uh, who wrote up what we were doing. Not a very good copy, so I blew it up a bit, and maybe you can see this. Using a bit of purple prose, he says, this mighty band of Rutgers researchers foresees many computers and terminals in the average home in the future. This is 1976. Among other things, the terminals would handle family finances, give instant in-depth news about any spot on the globe, list local shopping bargains, provide cheap, cheap printouts of any thousands of books, plan family diets, help diagnose ailments, run home heating and electrical systems, yield barter information, and perform a variety of chores. So I would say that's not a bad prediction for 1975, okay? when we were just barely beginning to <coughs> deal with our PDP-11. So it shows Saul's incredible vision you know, for what computers can do and his anticipation of the trends. At the same time, he set up our infrastructure by creating the Laboratory for Computer Science <coughs> Research. And being on the commission of the governor of New Jersey at the time, Rutgers <coughs> target state money, he was able to work with Tom and myself on a number of these committees and uh, convince the government of New Jersey to invest in the universities, of which Rutgers was fortunate to get a lion's share of centers that essentially helped develop the whole field. His national and international a distinction was attested by his being uh, the general chair of ICHCAI, International Joint Conference on Artificial Intelligence, was held in Karlsruhe in 1983. And here, another historical piece. I have the original communication where Tom Mitchell uh, gave the Computers and Thought lecture. The original message from Alan Bundy, rather hard to see on the old paper, that uh, thermal paper that now kind of gets uh, the case over, it, over time, you know, and t telling us all about the views and thoughts more than Tom got. Yes? You guys might not Not bad, <laughs> for those days. <laughs> At the same time, so was summarizing all the research that we've been doing here at Rutgers, and wrote the introduction to a history of the uh, effort that we had. And he was doing some very important activity with the government, with the Jason Committee, looking at something that probably goes back to his days as a uh, saboteur called radical computing. Uh, actually saw saved AI from a fate that befell it in Britain with the Lighthill Report. This is something that's very little known. But back in the 70s, Saul was on a committee that was advising the government on the future of AI and computer science and the funding with DARPA. And there was, it was largely dominated by physicists and mathematicians who were somewhat skeptical about the future of AI. So as the representative of AI was able to essentially convince people, no doubt with his legendary assistance, as well as strong arguments, that there really was something to look forward to that AI was going to come into the mainstream and therefore DARPA continued funding it. And it didn't uh, suffer the fate that it did in Britain where it essentially lay fallow for almost 
15, 20 years. So became, was then recruited in the mid 80s uh, to head up the ISTO office at DARPA. And he also organized the very important Information Science and Technology Study Group, or ISAP, which was headed by Raj Reddy, who we're fortunate to have with us today, and has a number of other very well-known names here, including Ed, who we've heard about, and Alice Payne, and Joe Trout, and so on. So it also was a critical catalyst in the development of high-performance computing. He headed the Computer Research and Development Subcommittee uh, under the Fixit Committee that essentially spearheaded the whole activity in high-performance computing. He wrote articles tirelessly on all the different technologies, both internally and externally. And he sponsored a history of information processing techniques developed uh, as a result of the funding of DARPA that has basically put the United States in the premier position in this research. And he went before Congress time and time again, most recently in 1995. And he continues to talk about this night. As recently as February 14, 1998, before the AAAS, he talks about the success story that <coughs> this has been thanks largely to his work and the work of many of the people in this room. Of course, no such good deeds go unpunished. He was also uh, was able to bring, as a result of this, the largest grant in Rutgers history, $12.4 million for computer science here to our department and to many of the collaborative groups that our people work with on high performance or hypercomputing and design, going back to his engineering roots, roots and seeing how AI and design can work symbiotically together. So all has been recognized many, many times. Here with me, we were founding uh, fellows of the AAAI. So has been recognized by the university. He was given the uh, award, Board of Trustees Award for Excellence in Research. So there's many, many reasons why Sol should look so happy as he's shown here in his current <laughs> office. But what we're hoping is that by the end of today, he will look even happier. And he will go back to his picture that I found from 1969 before he came to Rutgers, <laughs> which is the only picture that I have seen of Sol actually with his feet up and drinking and relaxing. <laughs> Any of you who know Saul know that he has a very, very hard time <laughs> show his, that he can relax in public. So we hope that by the end of today, this is how we will see Saul. So we appreciate very much all the wonderful things you have done for all of us, all that you have taught us, and I hope that this gives some glimpse into the tremendous work that you have done, the vision that you have shown. I would like to conclude this by saying that Recently, just this last month, an incredible book has come out, put out by the founder of social biology called Edward Wilson. It's called Consilience, or the Jumping Together of Knowledge, where he argues for a new biological enlightenment. I think it is fair to say, in conclusion, that Saul has led us to a new enlightenment in computer science by his, the unity of his vision of problem solving and representing knowledge, and really, really have been fortunate to be able to learn from him. Thank you so much. So, uh, ordinarily we would uh, pause for questions, but uh, as, as it has been, well, I don't think you've left anything to be questioned anymore. Uh, 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 but, so Craig warned me that as he got into this, he gathered more and more material and may go over on time. I didn't have the, uh, you know, the courage to interrupt because... Uh, I'm sorry, but that's another bad thing I learned from Saul. Saul never finishes a talk on time. <laughs> <laughs> but also, uh, Kaz, uh, I'll uh, speak on Kaz's behalf, uh, maybe guess that he'd like this. Um, Kaz has been gathering a lot of information, of, a lot of materials about um, Saul and his history and has been talking about putting together something more official. If any of you have information about Saul, I'm sure he would appreciate receiving that. Okay, also, um, this also explains why casual the years keeps moving into bigger and bigger offices. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs>